So I've got two fours and a queen. This makes it easier for you to follow the queen. That's the one you're going to try to follow. Does that make sense? Okay, watch carefully. You hold like the queen. This. You Which one's the queen? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right here. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to let you hold it, okay? So forget the fours. Focus on the queen. I'm going to tell you the moment the misdirection's happening. Are you ready? Here it goes. Okay, you ready? Are you ready? Here you go. There it is. Hold on to it. Did you see it? Did you see it? That's the queen. How? Take a look. So, how do you? Let's do this. I'm going to take the four, place that. Put your hand on the four, get rid of it. Okay, put your hand on that. Now watch this. Take a look at that. If I go like this, watch here, watch here. Okay, watch. You're not putting the queen on the money. There's no way. There's no way. Yo! Magic is that moment where you allow the audience to feel like a kid again. You start with the setup tell the audience what it is that you are about to accomplish. And then you, at some level, have to build suspense. Can he make it all the way through? Okay, put it right there. And then you have the reveal. <laughs> Did you already put it in there? The reveal is you always want to deliver more than you promise. That wasn't it, was it? Okay. For me uh, as a performer, so. yeah, there's an element of, uh, maybe yeah. I made a mistake. Uh-oh, like, I think he's blown yeah. it. And then, Double down. Watch carefully to a diamond. Watch it. Watch it. I don't have a power. I don't have an ability. Just a combination of psychology, sleight of hand, this misdirection of things that are happening that you don't see to give the appearance that I'm doing that much right? more than I can. That was your card? That's my card. Yeah. I'm pretending on stage to have an ability, but it's not real. My cousin had a bunch of Mickey Mouse books, and one of them happened to be Mickey Mouse Magic Book, and this is the exact one. I would do it for my brother, I would do it for my mom and dad, and magic was just the smallest part of my life. It's almost like friends who know jokes. Hey, I know a joke. Oh my gosh, I know a joke. And, you know, and then you buy a joke book, not planning on being a comedian one day. This was the first book that I bought, A Tarbell Course of Magic. It was like an eight volume set. Anytime we were at a store that had these magic tricks, like I would want to buy it. Yeah, it's just this little opportunity going into my senior year of high school to perform at a birthday party. And I was locked in. Right around that season, it was almost the exact same time, we were pretty closely paralleled. I have a man introduce me to Jesus. Church was like kind of a part of our life, sort of, when we were younger, but I had no clue who Jesus was. Because we had gone to this church, you know, a few times, you know, your name gets put on like a Sunday school roster and they like hunt you down. This youth pastor literally comes and knocks on our door and uh, asks me to go to youth group. And I mean, just like any teenager, when you don't want to do something, you're like, yeah, I'll see you there. And you just don't show up. And then he comes back. I remember him sitting across the table and going, Drew, what do you know about the Bible? I was like, I think that Jesus is like the main character. I had, I think, some idea of faith. I'm an American, like that's part of the culture. Even though I didn't know much about God, it's not something I ponder. I would have checked the box and said, I'm a Christian, if I was filling out a survey. This man invites me into his life and starts showing me who Jesus is. Like, no pressure, like, just loves me and just is constantly talking about Jesus. And I'm watching this man, the way he loves his family, the way he loves Jesus, like I'm just so intrigued. And the first time in my life, I call out to Jesus. God, if you're there, like I mean like legitimately there, like not just like in my mind, not just an idea, like not just a figment of my imagination, like you're really there, like I need to know. But in that moment, I felt as though God whispered directly to my heart. I was like, Drew, I'm here. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And that moment like flipped my world upside down. And I was like, man, I'm all in. I start following Jesus. It just cost me like walking away from a lot of things that weren't honoring to the Lord to start to pursue Him. My core struggle, like I desire people's approval. Like I want people to like me. And this is one of the areas that I have to constantly let him be enough instead of the audience. 
Okay. Now, uh, you've probably already lost. So, okay. I'm just starting to do well, these magic tricks. I'm starting to perform in youth group. And I start thinking, well, wow, if everyone like zeroes in and wants to watch the trick and most of the people just want to figure it out, why not share what God had just done in my life? Insert the gospel with two sponge balls. I take a ball and then I hand them a ball. I tell them that I'm gonna get their ball to jump over here with my ball in my hand. I explain real briefly that it's impossible. That if this ball represents their life and everything that they are, and this ball represents God and everything that He is, no matter how hard we try to get from here to here, we can't do it on our own. But what's so cool is that Jesus actually came to us, that He gave His life, so that what's broken could be fixed. It's the moment where everyone zeroes in and wants to see what's about to happen, and you know, a little magical gesture, and my ball's gone. Anything that happens in the spectator's hands is way more magical. And when they open their hand, they have both of them. God is willing and does all the work and is willing to move into our lives. Whether there's a decision right there to, to give their life to Jesus, I don't know, but it's a seed that I knew was planted and it's in a way where it wasn't weird or awkward and it made sense. So I performed on the streets and that trick actually opened a door. A youth pastor who sees it and goes, that's amazing. Would you be willing to come to our youth group perform and share your story. All of a sudden now I'm in college traveling around performing and the tricks begin to get bigger and I'm studying psychology. That was kind of always the plan. The, the magic thing, it's just been there, never building it into a career. And I was like, I'm gonna be a marriage and family counselor. That was the dream, that was where I was headed. And so I start incorporating some of the psychology that I'm learning onto the stage to now actually dabbling with what people call mentalism which is just magic tricks that are done more in the mind. But I get to the point where I'm getting closer to graduation and I have a moment of going, oh my gosh, like this could potentially be a job for a bit. Would you tell everyone, what was the word that you were thinking of when you were seated there? Say that out loud. Rainbow. Rainbow. More impressively, what was the word in the book? Say it out loud. Candlestick. Candlestick. If you guys would, would you give her a massive round of applause? Well done, ma'am. Mm. Run into a friend of mine, and we're studying for this intro to philosophy course, freshman level course. It's like three in the morning, and I'm like, what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? And he, he was a musician, played guitar. He's like, I don't know, I'm trying to figure it out. And he's like, I think I may want to do music. I was like, I think I kind of want to do magic. So we graduate, we like literally walk across the stage, we get in a car, and we just start driving. All we had to do is get him enough money to eat and enough money to get gas. If it doesn't work, we'll just go home. So we call everyone we know. We started out in South Carolina and just started driving to the West Coast, performing anywhere that would allow us, from coffee shops to youth groups to event, like everything. So we never asked for any compensation. When we would go to a city and perform, people would make meals and they'd cook for us. And so, and then we'd hit the road. People just were so gracious. And we spent over a year living in a car driving around America. Very rarely do we put out for everyone to see what is actually true. As a performer, especially when you're in a place for just two or three days, it is so easy to convince everyone around you that you have everything put together. And so we have the ability to tell the story the way we want to. We want to misdirect our minds and, and our platforms to kind of hide what actually may be the secret to it all. And so we live in these snapshot moments. We're all drawn to that because we want to live in a better story. We really started kind of wrestling with the call that Jesus had put on our lives to make disciples, not just be performers. I love magic and illusions. But once again, this was just a platform to share about the one thing that's changed my life, about Jesus. We meet a college pastor in Washington State University. They start telling us about Washington State at the time was the most unchurched state in the U.S. You know, 35,000 college students and maybe two to 300 of them would ever step inside the doors of a church. That was the target. And they just looked at us and said, would you guys want to be a part of it? And then I have a, immediately get a phone call from a guy in Nashville 
I want to help you take this to the next level. I will give you a house you can live in. Uh, we'll pay you salary, and then you can make money off booking tours. I mean, like, lines out the dream as a performer. And so now I'm faced with this, like, okay, Washington feels like moving to Africa. It's unknown. It's scary. I know nothing about being a, on staff at a church, let alone a church planting. Nashville, where most of the guys that do what I do live. And I'm like praying, God, what do I do? This is a dream. And this is how I felt like the Lord would have been okay if I would have done either one. I felt like he just pressed into my heart. Drew, you could go to Nashville and keep performing. You could do that without me. If you move to Washington, there is no way in the world you could do this without me. And that was like so intriguing that God would go, Drew, I don't need you in Washington. I'm about to do something amazing, but there's an invitation. And that desperation for the Lord was like, oh, that sounds amazing. So that I'm going there. Washington is as far as you could possibly be in the continental US. So if, if I choose to move to Washington, I'm walking away from this sweet deal of Nashville being a performer. And I'm probably walking away from all of these events that I'll do. Magic was simply a vehicle that would open up the door for me to share the gospel. And so for me, the direction and the destination wasn't changing, it was the vehicle was changing. Like I legitimately thought, we're hanging this up. I guess this is over. Just a few short months and I get a phone call. I was pretty content, like I was pretty content not traveling, I was pretty content not moving to the big city of Nashville and trying to make it. I get a call, uh, they say, hey, we'd love for you to come and be a part of this event, and it was a pretty large event in Texas, one that I'd actually been to as a student. San Antonio. And I was like, yeah. well, yeah, that would be amazing. It like reopened everything, but at another Just level. A bit higher. I felt like I was performing and traveling in events at like this level, I decided to kill it and plant a church, and it's like this, this phone call starts coming through, which opens up the door for all of these platforms. The word house. Would you guys give him a massive round of applause? I think there were a couple of pieces that were involved in that. I think the Lord wanted to know, Drew, is it really on the altar? Because if it's not on the altar, and I take this to the next level, it's gonna become an idol. I also think they don't want just a performer at these events, they want a guy who can actually minister to people. And God was doing this amazing work in my life and teaching me how to do that. I think about the traveling, I think about the ministry, and everything is a product of relationships. It wasn't even a talent that got me through the door. It was someone that was willing to vouch for me, to go, hey, I'll put my neck on the line for this guy to be able to share his gift. So we feel like now there's a new adventure that's in front of us. I think the adventure that God has called us into is so much bigger, so much scarier, but so much more rewarding. And so what, what could it look like to just say yes and go, God, you've given me these cards, but I'm willing to put them on the table so that you can use them way better than I could. And we've all been blessed with gifts, talents, abilities, these, these wild cards that God gives us. It's like, hey, use these. And they're different, they're unique to you, a different combination. And the question I think that we all have to answer is how can we leverage our lives and our gifts for something bigger? What is that wild card that God has given you and blessed you with? How can you use it? And then how do you live a life where you're consistently saying yes to Jesus. If it fails, then so what? Like, who cares? You can go home and start something new. But more than likely, it probably won't fail. And it'll lead to another adventure. I want you to know that you're not here by accident. That God has a reason for you being here. We want to make a difference. I mean, as, as high school students, as middle school students, no one in this room wants to sign up for just an average or less than average life. 
Like we want to be a part of something great. It is the marking of your generation. The promise that Jesus is making is this. You, you guys are gonna do greater things than I did, is what Jesus says. And I don't know if, you, if you've read the Bible, but Jesus does some pretty crazy stuff. You and I, the calling on our life is to do more. But how? Because here's the deal. The same God that spoke the world into existence now chooses to take up residence inside of us. Our, our prayer stops being, God, would you just show up in my high school? And guess what? He's already there. Why? Because you're there. And he has left you here to point to him to make much of him. Well, he's gonna fill you with power. He's gonna send you into the world. Hey guys, I'm Drew Worsham and you're watching This Is Me TV.